came about, as Jez pointed out, is that I did put an advertisement in, on the first Holocaust Day of 2001. Remember, on Holocaust Day, remember there are 4 million Palestinian refugees, and I put my uh, uh, box, uh, post box, not expecting any supply, uh, reply. I got a reply from a man called Eric Lowe. And Eric Lowe had served in Palestine, 1945 to 48, and he invited me to, to Eden Camp, where they had their annual remembrance. And I got to know the gentleman there. As a matter of fact, they gave me their tie, because I'm very proud to show you the tie, uh, Palestine, 1945 to 45, with a little wooden scarab. Um, and I wanted to persuade the the, um, uh, the BBC or anybody else I came across to record these men. Right. But I couldn't get anyone to take an interest in recording these men. And at that time, I, I, up until that time, I hadn't made any films. I had actually been in films. I'd been in television commercials since age 15 and so on and so on. So I'd never been behind the camera, but I could find no one to record them. So in the end, I actually hired broadcast camera quality uh, and recorded them. And that will, is what you're going to see. But I, I want to say to you that of the 30 minutes that you're going to watch of very many um, uh, interviews, just excerpts from interviews, <coughs> I think you're going to agree with me that in Eric Lowe, who later on produced this uh, uh, book called The Forgotten Conscripts, he is our national treasure. There is a positive aspect to this entire story, and it's him. Because he shows us that as a man who is actually the lowest of the low in the army, an ordnance man, had a salt of the earth, had more going for him than the top brass and those who were making the policies. So it, sometimes it can be the case that the lowest of the low sometimes can be quite a leader. And this man yeah. is a leader, and I'm going to, to uh, take an interest in your interest in whether you agree with me that this man is a national treasure. So without any further uh, chat about it, let me uh, start it off. To عالشمس الما بتغيب لما دي ولا ولادي على حبك ما في حبيب The following are excerpts from my first two telling films screened in the House of Lords and the House of Commons in 2004. For over 50 years, untruths about the British and Palestine and about the Palestinians have been allowed to develop and flourish to the extent that the real truth is difficult to believe. stood on the way, that you know, had to go, had to go, and the, in our case, the Palestinians stood in their way. So, what they done to the Palestinian people is is, is just unacceptable. We are a Turukata activist uh, here in here in London. The Turukata is um, was founded in Jerusalem by beginning of the when the Zionists came along, and it was a, it was a kind of a headed by Rabbi Amram Blau. What sort of period? And I think it was in the twenties, and he was against the Zionism. And so your group is an international group. It's an international group. It's not. It's not a matter of members. It's it's all, all organization. It's just any any all volunteers who want to stick up to and demonstrate before the state. That was when the when the Zionists were trying to, to build the state from the you know politically, 
uh, from the world. Uh, and we had in Turkey we had someone called Dr. Yaakov Dihan, and he and he was working very hard on, on the international uh, scene to prevent the state from coming to, coming to being. He was assassinated by the Zionists in cold blood, and uh, since since then, since his assassination, the Naturikata. Uh, so the power went down. The Israeli managed to win a propaganda war over the la, over the la, you know the first years of the state, the founding of the state. Turn speak is what Norman Finkelstein says is how the things are portrayed. He says that turn speak is the cynical inverting or distorting of facts. For example, making the victim appear a culprit. The Zionists are extremely good at propaganda war, especially when they have the American media with them and and they you know they. They're sophisticated and they and they look and they look you know good and that and the Arabs may be more traditional and and in religion and such things and this is explained Dr. Uh, Professor Norman Finkelstein in this, this in his book Trage the tragedy of Zionism Walter Lacure wrote in his standard history was it appeared on the international scheme and scene when there were no longer empty spaces on the world map this is not quite right. Rather, it was no longer politically tenable to create such spaces. Extermination had ceased to be an option of conquest. What Dr. Finkelstein and all other prominent Jewish spokesmen failed to mention, then as now, is that from 1946, Jews worldwide had the option to go directly to the ever safe and welcoming autonomous arms of their first Jewish homeland, founded in 1928 in the Jewish autonomous region called after its capital, Birobijan, a fertile region of 32,000 square kilometers situated on Russia's southeast border, now a Jewish republic. Israeli managed to win a propaganda war over the, la, over the la, you know the first years of the state, the founding of the state. Turn speak is what Norman Finkelstein says is how the things are portrayed. He says that turn speak is the cynical inverting or distorting of facts. For example, making the victim appear a culprit. The Zionists are extremely good at propaganda war, especially when they have the American media with them and and they you know they. They're sophisticated and they and they look and they look you know good and that and the Arabs may be more traditional in the, in, in religion. The whole idea that there is some sort of uh, a, a reaction, action and reaction is very false. The the action was that these people were uh, thrown out of their uh, lands that they lived in uh, th throughout the centuries. People who were thrown out of their own homes and they were forced out and a great deal of cruelty and a great deal of injustice was done to them. And not only that, but uh, even the nations of the world, for whatever reasons that they thought correct or, or otherwise, they kept silent about it. The power of the Zionism was such that they had the whole world mesmerized by what they called success. And it's, uh, it's very difficult to believe that the people in the world accepted this fallacy. They have accepted that these came and they came out from nowhere and they turned into uh, a blossoming Garden of Eden, something that was left by the Arabs who didn't care about but it. This is all fallacy and obviously it has only helped to aggravate the situation we have now. And the fact that these people have now become people who are willing to uh, kill themselves, and we're talking about not uh, some sort of uh, yobo in the street, but educated people, people who have everything to live for, and yet they're sacrificing themselves. Because they have, for all these years, been denied any way of sort of expressing their anger, any, any, any way of uh, being able to uh, uh, say to the world, look, we, we, we are human beings, we have been wronged, why don't you do something about it? And so this was the final uh, answer to it, to, to get the attention of the world. And uh, it's a great shame that they could not do this 
simply by saying, look, we are being wronged and the world didn't listen. My experience of Haifa, with some idea of what was happening to the Palestinians for the last 53 years, indeed over the entire 20th century, caused me to be taken aback by the idea that Britain was about to institute, from 2001, an annual Holocaust Day, which in the present-day circumstances seemed inadvertently to endorse the grossest of hypocrisies. Given that those same people, simultaneously, were terrorizing, tyrannizing, and daily humiliating, by contrast, a politically inoffensive Palestinian population. Systematically, and long planned since 1896, when the founder of Zionism, Theodor Herzl, wrote The Jewish State, an operations manual based on a literal old covenant with a racist god. In divinely commanded war, such as the settlers in the occupied territories, one must destroy, kill, eliminate men, women and children, there being no place for any humanitarian considerations. An Erats or greater biblical Israel, which shall encompass far more Arab land than Palestine. What actually the Israeli flag is still with the two blue stripes? And this means, I mean, of right and night. I mean, it's obvious. Israel, I understand, has no borders. It's therefore an illegal state without stating its borders. You can have one disputed border usually, but Israel didn't commit itself unilaterally to any borders. It didn't city map to the UN and give it, I mean, its designation borders. And that's very dangerous for a state, you know. Yet most Zionists, like mostly secular Jews, do not believe in the God they use to justify their claim to a metaphysical Israel made literal as their promised land. They, 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 want, they, they wanted to, to rely on the Bible and they didn't even believe in the Bible. Preaching something for, like chosen people but, but they, they, how can they believe in, in this verse? Secular Church. Secular Church, yeah. However, it is rarely observed that Zionism predates Nazism by half a century. The Zionists were very well aware that uh, the ideology of Zionism, the, 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 the fights that they've had in Russia and so on, none of them managed to achieve what they wanted to do because they weren't powerful enough to do so. So they needed to have guilt and the only guilt that they could achieve is by getting this uh, uh, Jewish blood that they could barter with afterwards. And therefore, they, as you say, that they, they had set up this secular covenant to, to, to um, uh, spill the Jewish blood in order for them to be able to then barter it later on with the nations of the world as a guilt money, as, 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 as blood money, libel for, uh, for, for uh, getting the end. Rabbis of the West Bank have the journal, they, they declared in the journal, they, um, in a Kudah journal it's called, they said, those among us who call for humanitarian, humanitarian attitude towards our Arab neighbours are reading the halakha, religious law, selectively and avoiding specific commandments. I mean, I'm wondering who is avoiding this, the basic of Judaism. We call them not rabbis, we call them traitors. For example, this is the diaries of um, Theodor Herzl. Right, he writes like this. We shall make this appear. Spirit the Palestinians pour across the border, unnoticed, by procuring employment for them in transit countries, while denying it its own country. The process of expropriation expropriation and removal must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. circumspectly. So this is, this is relevant to nowadays what the, 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 the world's, the politicians of today should really be honest and go to the root cause of, the, of all the bloodshed and realize 
it's no favor for the Jewish people. What, her, what the, the, the Zionists, the it's just a, thought the Herzl brought a misfortune to the Jewish people. Israel, can you give me your definition of anti-Semitism? Yes, anti-Semites are the people who doubt or deny inherent benevolence of the Jews to Gentile society. I'm not in favor of indulging in comparative martyrology. And anyway, I don't know of any criteria of measurement of pain, how to quantify and measure suffering. And I believe that we, the Palestinians, are not children of the race of God. So I placed a personal announcement in the columns of the Times and the Daily Telegraph, which read, On Holocaust Day, remember there four million Palestinian refugees. Mr. Eric Lowe answered my announcement and very kindly sent me some copies of his Palestine scrapbook, in which he had invited many of his comrades to give eyewitness accounts of their experiences whilst serving in Palestine up to 1948. I have met many of his comrades at Fort Nelson and Eden Camp, and since they were wishing to put the record straight, to dispute some of the turnspeak we'd been presented for so long. I've been a little bit reluctant to come here uh, and, and talk to you in this vein uh, because uh, of Jewish friends that I've met uh, 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 and become mates with um, in this country. Uh, and uh, uh, I've, I feel as though they might think that, hello, What's happened to old Jeffrey? Has he gone anti-Semite all of a sudden? You know, no, I haven't. But that's what happened. And well, just as King Ibn Saud said in a letter to, uh, many letters actually, to Roosevelt and Truman, that no country, what country, would deliberately allow into it foreigners who wanted to become the majority and to rule that country. And he, his wisdom, we really do need to keep going back to the beginning of, uh, of the period uh, to, to see what was the prompt, the cause, as opposed to being deflected to the result. The average British soldier uh, uh, who'd been sent to Palestine uh, was rather bewildered, uh, having uh, lived in Britain for five years uh, and fought a war against the Germans, who were the people responsible for killing Jews in Europe, uh, uh, we would have thought that, that we and the Jews had had common cause. Uh, 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 and having arrived in Palestine and found that we were, we were being not just snubbed by the Jewish population, um, we didn't expect to be treated as heroes or, 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 or deliverers, but we were treated as enemies uh, uh, and we were being shot and bombed uh, and it was just complete bafflement, you know, why? I thought it would be interesting to get Philip Knightley to interview Mr Lowe. Mr Knightley had worked for 20 years on the Sunday Times. Having written a history on war correspondence from the late 19th century about how they'd had to deal with imposed mendacity and censure, yet 1945 to 1948, that period, was not in his book. It is a war and a period, for some reason, that we, we were not to hear about. <laughs> I was relieved when my time for, to go in the forces came along. I was 18. It came almost on my birthday. I was called up and we weren't surprised. We had thought that, that war had ended and conscription would end with it, but it didn't end. Within three or four months, I was called for overseas posting. 
at rather extended leave, various injections, and eventually on the 17th of February, we set sail for Palestine. What was happening uh, when you got there? Well, um, it, was a, it was a trouble to, uh, of a degree I never thought possible. We come through Egypt. People were host hostile in Egypt. They'd, uh, the trains had shutters on so they could stop throwing things into the windows. The climate got better as we went through Rafa. We had sights of the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. It seemed peaceful. The Arabs that which greeted the trains, selling us fruit, their vegetables, their eggs, their bread, they all seemed very pleasant, totally different from the ones we'd seen in Egypt. And then when we got there, we were whipped to a camp, Camp 153, and we were told of the troubles. The first thing I was told was that the problem here, it is like as if the Romans were coming back to Britain and claiming Britain for themselves. The Romans being the Jewish refugees coming to Palestine from all over Europe. Yes, we'd seen the Jewish refugees on, on, on films. We'd heard them on, on the radio and uh, everything. It's, you, you were horror-struck with, with what was going on, you know. We, we felt sympathy for them. Professor Robert Forreston. Many European Jews died as a result of wartime actions, and notably in the typhus epidemic. But many Jews survived, and in their millions dispersed throughout the world, going as far as to create and people a new state, just three years later, that of Israel in 1948. But then you realise that this Palestine was no bigger than Wales. Very small, it was a poor country, and uh, they were expected to tolerate that, to the numbers going like that. Why were they going there? I mean, Britain promised a national home to the world's Jewry if they went to Palestine? It was a letter from Lord Balfour to Baron Rothschild promising them a homeland, not a state, a homeland. But he did add something that's got forgotten, not to the detriment of the, of the indigenous population. Uh, you saw these people, pitiful they were, and, and you felt sorry for them, but then you realized these people were terrible. They were throwing bombs into open trucks, and it started in 1945, apparently, and worsened as the Time went on in December 45, just to show us strength, the Ergun joined forces with the Haganah and they, put, they did a hundred bombs on various installations, police stations, railways, everywhere. So these were terrorists you're talking about? Oh, entirely terrorists. In fact, the first people they killed and, and, and that thing were, were, were Jews and Arabs. So what was the aim of all this? I mean, what, what were the, these Jewish terrorist organizations trying to achieve? The British government wanted to, to limit the number of refugees coming in, and they didn't want to. One incident that happened, the ship pulled into Haifa, and Britain was turning these ships back and sending them off to various destinations. And so that it wouldn't be turned back, the Jews planted a bomb in the engine room to disable the ship. Unfortunately, more than disabled it, it was crowded with refugees. They sank it. They killed these refugees. They killed one or two Britons that were on. My friend Bill Taylor was on that ship. He was thrown into the sea. And for initially, they couldn't believe that it had been done by, by their own people, by the Stone Gang. The Stone Gang, of course, became a notorious uh, terrorist organization. Yes, well, they were active in a way during the during the war. I mean, the Stern Gang was started by Abraham Stern. And in fact, he was advising people not to join the British Army, but to fight the arch enemy, which was Britain. And they were publishing leaflets and everything, and robbing banks. And in 1942, uh, Menachem Begin came to Palestine from Poland, looking to fight freedom for his, what he called his country, and he took leadership of the Stern Gang. Could you tell me something about the uh, way that Jewish terrorists bombed the King David Hotel? 
I knew about it because everybody was talking about it. It had been up to that point the worst atrocity. 91 people killed. Uh, many of them Arabs, probably more Arabs, simply because they were killed on a bus that was passing. Jews were killed in it. Very few British soldiers. And what they did, they dressed as Arabs and they took seven milk churns into the basement of the hotel they were packed with dynamite and then they let off a petard outside a small bomb to as they say to keep people away but that's when that small bomb went off it actually it killed more people simply because on the military wing they went out to the windows to see what had gone off in the street that wing then collapsed and that ki killed killed more at the beginning of 1947, a man called Dov Gruner had been arrested with a gun in his hand and he was part of uh, a, a raid on a bank and he had been, I gather, in the British Army but he was now a part of the terrorists. And he was wounded and captured and then duly hanged. And then they kidnapped two British sergeants Martin and Pace. They were in the Intelligence Corps at first. I think Britain was reluctant to say they were in the Intelligence Corps. They were talking to a Jew at a cafe off duty when they were kidnapped. They were hanged by one man in particular, a man called Paglin. And the Royal Engineer officer that went to cut them down was injured. by a mine, placed them in the ground below him. <clears throat> and, of course, there was terrible rage. Sixth Airborne Division were going to rebel. The ones that were stationed at Tel Aviv, the men, men were talking to mutiny. The officers, hearing of this, secretly locked all the weapons up. British politicians, Jewish politicians, were were enraged, saying them those people that did it were were going to be brought to justice. The Jewish agency had promised this. They never were brought to justice. In fact, Paglin became a, a minister for anti-terrorism in the post-war years. It must have been clear by this time that the aim of the Jewish terrorists was to drive the British out of Palestine, uh, leaving the road clear for these terrorists to settle whatever accounts they had with the Arabs. Well, even then, the partition was talked of. And we thought that the Arabs didn't want partition. They were very open about not wanting partition. It was their country and they didn't want to give one little bit of it. Everyone knows but not everyone sees that there is no solution to the question. No solution. I do not know what Arab will agree that Palestine should belong to the Jews. But what we didn't know was that the Jews didn't want a partition. In fact, they, in 1944, they'd already killed Lord Moyne, the Minister for Colonial Affairs that was responsible for partition when he was in Cairo. These people wanted to turn a free society into a restrictive, single culture society, a racial state, and the ethnic cleansing was planned before, it, before ever they had their war of independence. In fact, it was started before they had their war of independence. The old of the plain, uh, from, from Tel Aviv up to Haifa, was cleared of Arab settlements first. Some were massacred, and some fled. All the British troops began to hate the Jews. They began to write songs about them. And it all comes back. If you went to Eden Camp and really get to talk to the people, they don't like talking about it. They've been bullied by 50 years of never-ending propaganda. And of course, always, the core of it's the sympathy they had for the suffering that the Jews had during the war. It wasn't the Arabs. 
that, that, that put them in concentration camps. You refer to your, the people who served with you and yourself um, in Palestine at that time as the Forgotten Army. Uh, well, I've, if you've seen it anywhere, if you've heard it mentioned on Armistice Day that, or paraded that, that or the number of lives lost in Palestine as anywhere. Other people have claimed forgotten armies, but we really were the forgotten armies. <laughs> question that 100,000 men that were tied up in Palestine, I think it should be pointed out that only a handful of them, by comparison, were actually uh, acting as peacekeepers, keeping the Jewish terrorists in order. Whilst uh, Ruth Gruber jubilantly announced that, that she was the handful of freedom fighters were successfully keeping check on a hundred thousand crack troops was totally a, we were not crack troops most of us were clerks they were little boys they were 18 year olds and they were doing clerical work drivers mechanics and storemen and, and uh, that formed the two the royal army ordnance corps and the royal electrical engineers the, the other men were the infantry people, and they they were doing it. And they were, they did a grand job keeping down on against what turned out to be. Although you didn't, re as time went by, you realised it wasn't just the terrorists. There was everyone. No, no one ever gave anyone away. No one ever surrendered anything. They all concealed arms. They all concealed terrorists. Was that once they got back into their quarters, they were lost. And very difficult, and. Uh, so you were, in effect, uh, against the entire Jewish population. You couldn't, it got to the level where you couldn't trust the Jewish employees. I've heard, Mr. Lowe, from people in Haifa that the Kaya, the Kaya Beach Cemetery, where the British were buried, uh, I believe, up until 1945, that the wall of that uh, cemetery has now been moved back many feet and that the sign is now put inside the gate so that it appears that the witness, even the dead witness, appears to be uh, being eliminated from history. Yes, um, I didn't know about the wall being moved. I'm not at all surprised. I mean, I know that they've had a little regard for the established cemeteries anyway. There are several cemeteries in Palestine. Most of them uh, were from some re in Jerusalem, for example, from the First World War. But this one, the Kayat Beach Cemetery in particular, it's, it's one that concerned us because it was nearest to our camp. In fact, one of our camps, our sub-depots, was right on the, on the perimeter of, of, of that camp. Eric Long, one old comrade who since sadly died, you may have seen him at uh, Fort Nelson, he was on the first trip to Fort Nelson. He went back to see and he was very alarmed to read on the sign that it didn't mention anyone that had died after 1939 and yet many were. To find they weren't even mentioned, no mention was made at all about the British soldiers that died between 1945 and 1948. Yet the graves are in there and, uh, it's almost like you disappear, like the Palestinians. It, it, All the it is. It comes back to this basic question of why? Why should that be? You know, why? Why? Why can't we have this recognition? And and the other thing, the two are tied together: the recognition for us and the appreciation of what the Palestinians have lost. You know, I think it's. It's one of those sad things of history that they hope they were, but the Palestinians won't let it die, and, and we won't let it die while until the last of us is gone.
they didn't think it was going to happen. That's why Al Akbar was a, a disaster for them. It just happened. The final chapter in their country being stolen you know, by stealth and eventually by brutal force. Good man. Yeah. And Lady Michelle Renouf is a good woman. <laughs> <laughs> 